On January 1st, 1937, Machen lay on his deathbed. The semester at Westminster was concluded, and although his colleagues had been urging him to get rest uh, because he looked extremely tired, in fact, one uh, person said he looked deadly tired, uh, despite this, he never refused a speaking engagement, and so, in the dead of winter, John Gresham Machen traveled by train to North Dakota to preach at a few churches there. Ned Stonehouse, who was his colleague at Westminster and also the author of a lengthy biography of Machen, said that there was no one of sufficient influence to constrain him to curtail his program to any significant degree. Machen was never married. He never had any children. At this point, his parents had both passed on, his family wasn't close to him, and so he had nobody really to bring him down to reality and help him see that he needed to actually take care of his body. And although he was the leader of the conservative movement in Presbyterianism, he was quite isolated, and so he was at his own mercy. And we'll talk more about this later. So there, on New Year's Day, at about 7.30 p.m., Machen passed into glory. His last recorded words were these, I'm so thankful for the active obedience of Christ, no hope without it. These are the words of a theologian, as T2 pointed out in a couple, well, less than a couple weeks ago, and we'll see why this is so important later. Just seven years prior to this, Machen had helped found Westminster Seminary in Philadelphia, and this was to continue the, old, the line of Old Princeton. It was to carry forth the banner of Reformed Orthodoxy. The Orthodox Presbyterian Church, which was originally named the Presbyterian Church in America, was in its infancy, being only six months old, and Machen, in June, had been elected its first moderator. See, both Westminster and the OPC were the result of Machen being defrocked or stripped of his preaching credentials in 1935. Machen went through the appeals process. He appealed both to the Synod and then to the General Assembly and lost both appeals in, I think, what we would all term a travesty of justice. The issue that gave rise to his excommunication was Machen's founding of an independent missions board. He could not in good conscience support the Presbyterian Board of Foreign Missions, who, which supported missionaries who were not committed to orthodoxy. The most famous missionary of this time was a woman by the name of Pearl Buck. She was a well-known author. Uh, she authored several books, one uh, most popular called The Good Earth. And so when in 1933, the Literary Digest published a story uh, with the heading, Mrs. Buck Under Fire as a Heretic. And this was accompanied by pictures of her and John Gresham Machen. Under the subheading of this was the title, uh, or the words, a stern Calvinist John Gresham Machen will carry his fight against Mrs. Buck and the Presbyterian Board of Foreign Missions to the people of the church. To give you an idea of what Pearl Buck believed, she once said this, Then Christ lived and lives, whether he was once a body and one soul, or whether he is the essence of men's highest dreams. An actual, real Christ did not matter to her. She also said that preaching was not just unnecessary. She didn't like the preaching of the gospel. She said it was actually harmful. So both a denial of the person of Christ and repudiation of the preaching of the gospel were her beliefs. And yet, when these issues came up, the Presbyterian Board of Foreign Missions actually sided with her and not with Machen. And this was the, uh, this was really the issue that got the wheels turning. This is what made Machen found his own independent board of foreign missions. Eventually, to give you an idea of how the General Assembly 
uh, viewed this action on Machen's part. And really, this is because there was money leaving the missions board and going to, to his. This is what finally got them to take action. But this is what they said in their ruling. A church member that will not give to promote the officially authorized missionary program of the Presbyterian Church is in exactly the same position with reference to the constitution of the church as a, ch as a church member that would refuse to take part in the celebration of the Lord's Supper or any other prescribed ordinance of the, of the denomination. It's a pretty amazing statement, really. You know, someone who doesn't support a missions board is in the same position of someone who refuses to take the Lord's Supper. That's, that's how they viewed Machen. Before we get into the nitty-gritty of Machen's life and, and, and this controversy and his views on it, uh, let's talk a little bit about Machen the person. Where was he from? Uh, what was his influences, what were, what were his upbringing, and uh, what made him the man that he was. He was born in Baltimore, Maryland on July 28th, 1881, and this was just 16 years after the Civil War. His mother was quite successful. She was an author. She had published at least one book, and uh, her, his father was also a successful lawyer in Baltimore, so they were, they were well off and Machen was well educated from his youth uh, and his family were devout Christians, they were devout Presbyterians. So he had a good, good upbringing, uh, a wealthy upbringing, and uh, he had uh, a, a very good education. Latin was stressed, uh, the classics were stressed uh, in his education, and so that was formative for Machen. He was also wealthy. When his mother died, he inherited $50,000 and uh, when his father died, he inherited a similar amount. For perspective, $50,000 in today's money is about $900,000. So he inherited close to a million dollars twice in his life. And uh, when he died, his net worth was about $250,000, which today is around $4.5 So when we, when we read about Machen funding these projects and founding these institutions and and paying for it out of pocket, that's, what he, that's why he was able to do that, because he was quite wealthy. Machen went to Princeton Seminary, and afterwards he went to Germany and studied New Testament, which would also be a formative time for him. When he was there, he came under the influence of a German theologian, Wilhelm Hermann, who represented the best of what Machen would later oppose. And Herman was, uh, as Machen describes him, he was very, very devout in his, his faith. He was deeply and joyfully and passionately devout in his Christianity. And, uh, and this is something that Machen had not experienced in the Presbyterian Church. Uh, because of this encounter, Machen actually went through a very serious season of doubt and struggle with his faith. And uh, this would actually give him sympathy with people who were having similar doubts and struggles with their face, faith. After his year in Germany, he returned to the United States. Uh, his faith was intact, and then at that point he began his two decades of teaching at Princeton Seminary, uh, which is where he would fight modernism. Now, Machen did not like the term fundamentalism, actually. He, he said, do you suppose that I regret my being called a term that I greatly dislike, a fundamentalist? Most certainly I do. But in the presence of a great common foe, I have little time to be attacking my brethren who stand with me in the defense of the word of God. So Machen didn't like to be pigeonholed by the term fundamentalism or fundamentalist. He thought it was too narrow of a term. It's not that he thought the fundamentalists were necessarily wrong in what they were defending. He was just, he felt that he was defending something that was bigger than just a, a set of doctrines, a particular set of doctrines, the fundamentals, as it were. The term that Machen preferred was Calvinist. He preferred the Reformed faith. Uh, for in Calvinism, Machen saw the best, the most consistent, and the easiest to defend system of Christian thought. He uh, actually expressed that Calvinism is the perfect expression 
of Christianity. And he put this opposed to modernism, which he said was a completely different religion altogether. Uh, modern, modernism, in Machen's mind, was not a representation of Christianity at all. Uh, Machen would speak of the Lutherans being a sister form of Christianity and Arminianism being a, a, a different form of Christianity, uh, maybe a little bit of a rebellious form of Christianity, but a form of Christianity nonetheless. Uh, modernism he termed as a different religion altogether. In fact, his, uh, his book was titled Christianity and Liberalism, and liberalism is just another synonymous term for modernism. Uh, so he set in his probably his most famous book, Christianity, against liberalism or modernism. Machen uh, viewed modernists not merely as people who had denied some of the fundamental doctrines like the virgin birth, uh, the humanity of Christ, or even just Christ being a real person, or the resurrection, other supernatural events, but as people who denied so much more than that. Machen sought in his study of modernism and in his defense of fundamentalism and in his really on his attacks on liberalism and modernism, uh, he sought to plumb the depths of the relationship between the culture, modernity, and modernism. And so he, uh, he came up with a critical assessment of what modern, modernism was. There were certain ideas that Machen was fighting against. There was a suspicion of the past, believing that uh, the past really doesn't have much value. There was skepticism about truth and a replacement of the truth with what is pragmatic or utilitarian. And then there was a denial of the supernatural. And these three ideas, these three main ideas, are what produced the modernist religion. Modernism really was a theological response to the problem of modernity. How does Christianity survive? How does Christianity go on in an age of science? That was the question that modernists were trying to answer. And in doing so, in, in answering that question, they really denied uh, the things that I just mentioned. They were suspect of the past. They uh, did not really believe in, in absolute truths anymore. They were skeptical about it and replaced it with pragmatism and they denied the supernatural because if we are people of science, we cannot be people of the supernatural as well. And on, on the problem of modernism, Machen wrote this uh, in his book entitled, What is Faith? He says, it makes very little difference how much or how little of the creeds the church of modernist preachers of the modernist preacher affirms, or how much or how little of the biblical teaching from which the creeds are derived. He might affirm every jot and tittle of the Westminster Confession, for example, and yet be separated by a great gulf from the Reformed faith. It is not that part is denied and the rest is affirmed, but still all is denied because all is affirmed as merely useful or symbolic and not as true. And this really was a concise summary of what modernism was. That was the spirit of the age. They didn't necessarily outright deny certain doctrinal truths. Uh, they certainly did deny certain doctrinal truths, but they marginalized them. They would affirm, oh yes, these things are true, but they would marginalize them. They would say they're just useful. They're not necessary, really. So this is why you had ministers who, as Machen says, they would affirm the Westminster Confession, but they would still be denying it. Modernism would essentially discard what was seen as not useful at the time, and then maybe pick it up later if it was needed or turned out to be useful. Modernism was also hostile to precise language. They, modernism does not like definitions. It does not like absolutes, absolute truth. A modernist could talk a lot about God and religion and faith without ever defining what he meant by those words. And so when a modernist speaks a, on a certain topic, you might think you understand what they're saying, but the meaning of those words are different. And we see that a lot today as well. Machen argued for facts. 
And modernism sought to destroy facts by destroying the, the foundation of objective truth. And Machen pointed out in his writings that Paul argued for facts. The New Testament was, is a, a book of polemics almost from beginning to end it was what Machen argues. For instance, Paul in the book of Philippians, he commends these people who are preaching the gospel, even though they were preaching the gospel out of envy, he commends them for preaching the gospel because they were getting the truth of the gospel correct. Even though they were trying to make Paul's life more difficult and his time in jail more uncomfortable, they were still preaching the truth, and so Paul actually rejoiced in that. On the other hand, when you read Galatians, the Galatian church was distorting the gospel. They were preaching something else, and so Paul condemned them. He actually pronounces a curse upon the church of Galatians for preaching another gospel. Facts matter in the New Testament, and modernism discarded facts. So on these grounds, Machen actually would argue that modernism is a completely different religion from Christianity. It's something completely else. It does not, uh, it does not have a foundation in objective truth. The truth was surrendered to pragmatism. Foundational truths were denied, and even those which appeared to be upheld were put to the margins because they're just merely useful. Modernism is still a scourge on us today. In some churches, it has completely taken over. It dominates the thinking of those in it. And being educated, knowing what, what the arguments that Machen would make, the things that he went through, uh, the, the study that he did, and what he wrote, is helpful for us because it can guard us against making those same mistakes. So let's talk about some lessons for today. Uh, from Machen's life. The first lesson is be open, be honest, be clear, be straightforward in the way you use language. If you use certain words that generally have an understood meaning, don't use those words in a way that has a different meaning other than, than the generally accepted meaning. I think we can think of uh, the word tolerance, for instance, is one. Uh, racism is another one. Racism used to mean, you know, judging someone by the content of their skin color. You know, we all think of Martin Luther King Jr. saying, you know, he, he has a dream of a day when people are judged by the content of, the character, of their character. Now racism means privilege plus power. Completely different idea. So don't use words in a way that is intentionally deceptive. Don't be evasive with your words. Be honest and straightforward. And this, this was one of the things that Machen uh, really disliked, is when if you, if you had someone who was denying the faith, but they weren't being honest with it, that really, really got under his skin. If you had someone who was doubting and was expressing their doubt and being honest, Machen was, was actually very compassionate about that because he himself had gone through that. Uh, the thing that really bothered him was when people were intentionally deceiving people by saying, oh yes, yeah, oh yes, we're, we affirm all these great doctrines. And yet when you look closely at what they're saying, they're actually denying those doctrines. Secondly, don't be afraid of doctrinal preaching and teaching. Doctrinal preaching ought to be seen, ought not to be seen as the best way to fail <laughs> as a preacher. Uh, one of the criticisms uh, that people make against doctrinal preaching is that it's boring and it's lifeless. And we need to be careful that our doctrinal teaching is not boring and lifeless. Really, our, our, our teaching and our preaching should present to the congregation the doctrines of the Holy Scriptures. And there should be energy, there should be life, there should be joy in that because we're studying God himself. When we look at the scripture, the scriptures reveal to us who God is. They reveal himself to us. And we should show that, we should convey that when we preach and show how these great doctrinal truths affect our life and, 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 and are fruitful in our lives. Another thing we learned from Machen's life <clears throat> is we need, to be, we need to found and maintain institutions that preserve <clears throat> and spread the gospel. Uh, seminaries, 
uh, writing books, uh, publishing journals, even blogs and podcasts in our day. All of these ought to be used to spread the gospel. <clears throat> Fourth is we need to have patience with strugglers who are having doubts about Christianity. One of the reasons Machen uh, cites for his uh, continuing in his Christianity, even though he had these great struggles with doubt, is that he had support and he had uh, patience and, and comfort and love from his friends and from his parents. And so when we, we come across someone who's doubting and having struggles, we ought to have a, a listening ear and not cast them aside or judge, uh, judge them for that. Machen's life, uh, well, maybe one of the biggest things that we learn from Machen's life is the value of having a God-centered worldview. Machen really sought to see everything through the lens of Scripture, uh, through, through God as the center of everything. Uh, Machen's God-centered view allowed him to see <clears throat> not just what the, the problems that modernism presented, but a fuller and deeper view. You know, he could, see, he could see not just this problem right here, but what did that problem lead to over here and over here and over here? And that's one of the reasons why he couldn't support the missionary board anymore, because he, he saw not just what this person was doing, what that denial would do, but he saw what it would lead to as well. And a God-centered worldview will help us see those things as well and keep us from many, er many errors. Machen's life teaches us uh, the value and the necessity of controversy. <clears throat> Machen said, <clears throat> every really great utterance, it may be said, is born in controversy. It is when men have felt compelled to take a stand against error that they have risen to the really great heights in celebration of truth. So a lot of times we want to avoid controversy because it's uncomfortable, we might be criticized, we might upset people, we want to be liked, we want to please people, and we need to shed ourselves of those things. We need to stand up for the truth when the truth is being attacked. And on that note, Machen's life uh, teaches us the inevitability and pain of criticism, even from people who are close to us. Machen was publicly accused of being unkind, of being bitter, of being suspicious and intolerant. In fact, he was even accused of secretly being a drunkard because he voted against a resolution in support of national prohibition. And really, we ought to expect this. We shouldn't be surprised by this. Uh, we ought to be brave enough to speak the truth, even when we know that it's going to invite criticism. Next, we learn the value of pacing ourselves. And we started this lesson talking about Machen. He was only 55 years old when he died. And he pushed himself to the limit, to his physical limit. Uh, he would never refuse a speaking engagement. And so even though he was, his colleagues said he looked deathly ill, he went to North Dakota in the dead of winter to preach. And he pushed himself too far. And it, it cost him his life. Spurgeon and Calvin both did the same thing. You know, Calvin, at the end of his life, he actually uh, said that he regretted pushing himself, that he should have taken better care of his body. And so we should also be aware of that. You know, if we're uh, not eating well, we're not getting exercise, we're staying up too late, we're, we're pushing ourselves, running ourselves ragged, we need to take care of ourselves. Uh, and what if Machen had taken care of himself? What if he had not gone on that trip? What if he'd taken the advice of his colleagues and just gotten some rest. Maybe he would have lived another 10 or 15 or 20 or 25 years. And what kind of benefit would the church have received from having Machen around for that much longer? Machen really is a, uh, a once in a generation, or maybe twice in a generation kind of a man, and yet his life was cut short. If we're prone to this, if we're prone to running ourselves ragged, then we may need to actually seek out some accountability for that. Next, we learn that uh, we should seek to remove cultural barriers to the gospel, in addition to preaching the straightforward gospel. Machen believed, of course, strongly in preaching the gospel, but he also believed in, in taking down barriers. 
removing uh, obstacles in people's minds to the gospel. You know, if people are more readily able to receive the gospel and don't have so many intellectual hang-ups and objections and cultural beliefs, then maybe that gospel is going to be more effective and, and be accepted more easily. And then the last thing we learn, and we'll conclude with this, is that God uses flawed men. I know I'm talking about obvious things here, but Machen wasn't a perfect man. He had the kind of personality that tended to drive people away. He, uh, it, you know, he may have been uh, unkind in some, in, in some ways. He had a tendency when someone disagreed with him to speak uh, harshly toward them and strongly. Uh, it, it's, but this is characteristic of all of us, isn't it? We all have flaws. We all have uh, character traits that are not perfect. And yet God uses men like Machen, men like me and others to, uh, to maintain the Orthodox faith. God graciously uses flawed men to achieve his great ends. And Machen was one of those flawed men that he used to preserve the Orthodox, the Reformed faith from being destroyed in a time when the largest Reformed denomination in the United States was swept away by uh, apostasy and a denial of fundamentals. We can be thankful for Machen today. Uh, we can be thankful that we have healthy, uh, lively, and growing Reformed denominations today because Machen and others like him were used by God to fight the good fight.